just two, three more points now and uh, uh, before we uh, conclude. Don't assume emails will deliver. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face as legitimate email marketing professionals that we all now are after 20 minutes talking about it is that much of what, uh, most of the email traffic out there is in fact spam. Um, so dirty, grungy, horrible spam stuff that's perpetrated by those people who do whack out these masses of email in the hope that some of them will reach a destination somewhere. And of course it's for you and I a bit of a pain, but for the internet mail companies especially, it's a massive incremental um, cost overhead to them. They have to maintain, as you can see here, four times the amount of server hardware just to cope with that weight of email. So they're the ones that fight, in fact, the most rigorously to keep spam email out. So the spam filter uh, developers are, are, are working to be more, become more sophisticated all the time, but of course the spammers are doing the same thing, trying to, trying to get a bit cat and mouse, if you like. So we need to have some kind of policy, some means of differentiating what we do from spam. Uh, and it needs to be something more sophisticated than not, than not writing a word in our email content in our template that a spam filter might uh, be triggered by. Uh, and th th just the point I wanted to make around it, it is quite a complex situation. So the policy needs to be something, again, more sophisticated than just not writing words in there that you think are dodgy. Spam filters are very sophisticated. They have to do two things extremely well. They have to keep out spam, but equally they have to allow through to the recipient content that they would actually want to receive, things that they've signed up for. So it's a bit of a delicate balance that, they've, uh, that they have to find. And right at the heart of spam filters is this theory crafted by uh, Bayes that's evolved now into uh, <clears throat> what's called the Spam Assassin open source project that sits at the heart of most modern spam filters. And uh, you'll see it's represented by a formula which I guess you'll interpret yourselves easily enough. I've tried to simplify it. Uh, above with some text, but even in so doing, I think I've probably mystified it all the more. But if you were to pick through that description, what you'll see that Bayes is saying is that you can't just look at one element of the email and make a decision that spam. You have to take into account a number of circumstances, a number of characteristics, not only the text, but where it's come from, what's in the subject line, what's in the from line, where's the sending server, you know, is there a reputation for this email sender? It's, it's quite a complex and rich mix of things that are considered. So in order to uh, combat that, Again, the tools provide quite a reasonable solution. All the email marketing tools that uh, are out there, or most of them, what they've done in order to establish themselves as a provider of this service is create or establish a reputation with the internet community, with spam filter developers, with um, the people that uh, run internet-based mail systems. And they demonstrated that they only allow people to operate their systems with permission-based email. So they maintain the very highest standards of integrity. And that means that they're established as what's called white-listed servers. So two things work for you here. All these, spam, all these email uh, service providers have within them a spam filter checker, such as this example above. So they can test your template. So when you've created your mail template, if you present it at your spam filter checker, they can analyze that template and then provide you with some guidance and advice on whether there are elements in there that you might want to change. Um, so, so they can you know, try and pre-handle any problems that might occur, but of course then when your email is sent out via these services, when it arrives at the, the gateway, the, uh, the email uh, server of its destination, because it's a whitelisted sending source, it's more likely actually to be allowed through to the recipient. So there's a combination of factors there that conspire to help you to improve deliverability and get your mails through to the, uh, you know, through to the recipient. Just two final points, um, create good landing pages. The point I want to make here is that often people focus too much on the, the template within the email. They think around the template, the subject line, what should I put in the from line, um, and all of this stuff. Uh, and they assume that once somebody clicks on a link within the template, within the body of the email, their work is done. But of course, that's just the beginning of the experience as far as the recipient is concerned. 
And it's a simple thing again, this, but it's a common mistake made where people don't visualize the journey from send to end, if you like. So it's about walk a mile in their shoes, understand from the perspective of the person that will receive this email, what happens if they click on a link? What's going to motivate them to click on that link that takes them through to a website? What do they expect to find when they get there? Are they provided with information that satisfies their need or something that will continue to stimulate the desire to prompt them to engage further? Often people ignore that opportunity and they're just dumped on the homepage of a website. Hurrah, they clicked and actually they're very disappointed with what they find. So it's a simple thing, but I think it's the last thing that you need to do. So you know, the last thing that we do before we put a campaign out, when we design the process, you know, we, as the designers of it, we're too close to it to really see it. We'll get other colleagues in the office to go through the process. We'll send them a test email and we'll get them to check that it all flows nicely and makes sense and, and hangs together. It seems obvious, but lots of people don't do this stuff, but it's an end-to-end -end process and you need to measure it and visualize it before you do it as such. The final point that I just wanted to make uh, that I picked out of these 20 tips was just recognize the benefits of Web2. I mean, I'm not going to explain what all this is particularly, but I'm sure you've, uh, you've attended a lot of the other uh, meetings and uh, you know that Web2 is, is really about the interactive nature of the internet, the internet growing as a result of our collaborations and becoming more valuable to people by uh, presenting itself as an interactive medium. And that's true with email as well. And more and more what we're trying to do with email is it's a delivery mechanism, but use it in conjunction with other platforms. And of course, if I've got a thousand people in my database that I can send my emails to, that's fine. But uh, social media platforms, for example, integration with uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, MySpace, Twitter, allows me to reach a far greater audience than just the people in my database. So what we're doing generally with, e with our newsletters now is we just see that as common. Content. It's not particularly an email, it's just content. Uh, the email is one form of distribution, but what we'll also do is when we've created our template, we'll also, um, we'll also tweet it, uh, we'll also publish it to a variety of different media platforms as well so to see if we can get the viral component working to try and extend our reach far beyond what we might do within the original email. So I don't want to take up to, I'm conscious that we're running out of time now, but I just wanted to give you a, a few tasters really, a bit of a flavor of some of the areas that I think you can consider. Email is about doing lots of little things actually, just improving what you do bit by bit, month by month. I know we're all trying to run a business, so if I spend all my time doing everything that you want me to do in terms of email and social media and web development, when do I get to run my business? But it is about, each time you do it, just, just improving it a little bit, you know, just getting slightly smarter with each, with each send and measuring the, uh, measuring the results, what worked, building on that, uh, what didn't work, learning from that. And you can actually you know, get some really powerful results if you just put in a little bit of a forethought and planning. So we'll, we'll leave it there. I hope that's been useful. I'm, I'm, I don't know if we've got time for a couple of questions. Have we?